Hey, what's happening, everybody? This is Michael Oski. I'm from ProAudioLessons.com and ProWestRecording.com. Got a quick lesson for you today. I wanted to go over two things um, that are important, and some people ask uh, questions about from time to time, so I figured I'd address it. Um, one is, what is the difference between pre-fader and post-fader? Uh, that's a big question and something that you should definitely know. And then the follow-up to that question is, why would I want something to be uh, pre- or post-fader? And, you know, to answer that question, I'm going to use it in an example and show you um, exactly why you would want something pre-post-fader. There's many reasons in different, different scenarios where you would want something to be pre-fader or post-fader. And um, I'll go over a few of them. I'm going to show you one example, and then I'll discuss a few others. So this won't take long. This will be fun. Whoops. Uh, let me show you guys what's up. So first I just kind of, this is nothing special, I just kind of have a beat going on with some synths behind it. Um, and I'm going to use this as, an as the example for what we're doing. So just take a listen to what we got going on here. So to break it down, this is a beat that I just kind of created for fun using battery. So this is the this is the, the basis of the rhythm. Okay, and then we also have this going on. Okay. And then I also just have a repeat of the four on the floor of the kicks, okay? And this is what we're going to be using to uh, demonstrate the pre-post fader and uh, what we're going to accomplish and what's already kind of been shown is that ducking, right? So if you're ducking synths, in this case we kind of have a pad going on. Let me show you guys the pads. Okay, so a lot of times, in, especially in electronic dance music, um, you have this pumping sound to a synth, okay? And the way that you accomplish that is you're going to want to send, well, first of all, let, let's explain it this way. On the, um, the synth track itself, I've instantiated a compressor, okay? And this is just the compressor that comes stock with uh, Studio One in this case. This works on all DAWs, by the way. Um, the principles behind it are exactly the same. It's just going to look a little different. So I've instantiated a compressor on that synth part, and I've, uh, I've enabled the sidechain here by clicking this. Now what that means is, for those of you who no clue what sidechaining is, think of it in the most simplistic terms of, by default, a compressor, for example, on a track is looking at the information coming from that track and then it will process it accordingly, okay? So it, it reads the volume coming through and based on however far it's going over the threshold, it will compress based on the settings that you have. Okay, that's a really simple way of putting it, right? That's normal. Now, if you've instantiated a side chain, you're telling, in this case, the compressor to look for signal elsewhere, okay? An, an al alternative input to... to, to um, control what the compressor is doing to the track that it's on, okay? So the effect of the compressor will still be on our synths, but the synth pad itself is not causing the compressor to compress. Instead, an external source or a sidechain source is going to cause the compressor to react. Does that make sense? So what we're going to do is we've instantiated or we've put sidechain, we've instantiated the plugin, we've clicked on sidechain, and I had created. Remember, I just created this four on the floor. We're going to take a send off of that, okay, right here. And so what I could do is I'll remove this and show you it again. You're going to come into sends. You'll see sidechains, and look what it says: sidechain to the my tie insert slot one compressor. That's what we want. So now there's a digital copy of that four on the floor being sent to that compressor, okay? 
And what that's going to do is, is it's going to cause the synth to duck or be compressed every time the kick hits. Okay, so let's do this. Let's bring this up like this. We'll pin this here. And let's watch. Let me just solo those two things alone. And how much it ducks is all based on the compressor settings. So we can make sure the ratio is way up. We obviously want to adjust the threshold. And then the attack and release times are important. In this instance, I took note of the tempo, which in this case is 110. And there's a few converters online. Just Google uh, beats per minute converted to milliseconds. And you'll be able to determine what the appropriate attack release settings are. In this case, I found out right around 34 milliseconds. We'll make sure that the attack and release is happening in time with the tempo of the song itself. So the attack release settings are important. And then let's see how much we want it to dip, okay? That's obviously a whole lot. But I'm doing it for dramatic effect, so you can hear the effect, right? I probably wouldn't have it dip that much, but it's all up to you, Dan. Of course, it depends on the song. So, how am I going to use this to show you the, what the difference is between pre and post fader? This is the best example I can think of. Let's say, here, here, here's what we're going to do. Let me bring in this part. Okay? Now, let's say I wanted to send off of that part to get this to duck. Okay, so send, side chain, same thing. Okay, I have the other one muted, of course. So now all we have is that main rhythm part and the synths. Let's listen to how this reacts now. It's reacting to every single bit of the track, not just the kicks, the boom, boom, boom boom, which is all that I want the synths to duck on. But because there's so many other elements within this beat, the compressor is reacting to the hi-hats and the snares. And so it's ducking down and it kind of makes the synth sound odd. So what do I want to do? I only want it to duck on the, the four on the floor, right? The one, the two, the three, the four. So I created another instrument track, right? That's what this one is, with just, with just the kicks. Right, and that's where we're gonna get this right. But I don't wanna hear that kick. I already have a four on the floor in my main beat. So wouldn't it be cool if I could somehow turn down this four on the floor's fader volume, yet still have it affect the compressor? This is where a pre-post fader send is important, okay? Watch what happens. This is a normal send uh, right now. It's n it is in a, so by normal I mean by default it is always going to be in um, post fader. Okay, meaning that it is this send is post this fader, and I'll prove it. When I hit play and I start bringing down this fader, you'll notice that the effect, the ducking effect, starts to disappear. And even cooler in PreSonus Studio One, you can see here that it has a gain reduction meter, this yellow thing right here, this meter, that's showing you gain reduction, or in this case it's compression. So watch as I turn this down, not only does the four on the floor go away, but the effect of the duck goes away. Ah, but watch, now let's, by clicking here, we turn it turns yellow. In, Studio One, that means now that this send is pre-fader, meaning it's pre this fader. So if I were to hit play and start turning that fader down again, yes, you would lose the four on the floor, but the effect, the send would not be affected and the ducking effect will remain, watch. Get it? Makes sense? Pretty cool, right? I hear this all the time in modern music. All the time. So that's how they're doing it, guys. A lot of times in intros, before the beat comes in, you'll have just the synth going, and you'll hear it 
have a rhythm, like a rhythm and a pulse to it. That's how they're doing it. Okay, so that is a really good example of how pre and post fader um, work, and why you would want something to be pre fader, for example. Um, now what we can do is we can leave this fader down. We can bring in the rhythm, original rhythm part. Okay, and now it will the synths will only duck on the one, two, three, four, and we won't have duplicate kicks. And I would probably lessen up on the the amount of ducking going on. Very cool, right? Another instance where you would want to, where pre and post fader is really important is more in a live tracking sense than a mixing sense. And that's when you're setting up headphone mixes for your musicians, okay? Because you don't want, you want that mix to be unaffected by it, the faders that you may be pushing around in the control room. But um, that's just another example. And again, that's something that you would best learn by having watch someone do it for you while you're watching so maybe I'll make a video about that later but I think this was a really good way to just touch on that I think it's a good visual way for you to see how pre and post fader are working and I, again it's a good refresher for those uh, who already kind of knew what side chaining is and ducking and then a good introductory to someone who's never really noticed that before I'm sure you've heard it in music that you listen to all the time and you've never really understood how they do it now you do so anyway, thanks so much for watching. Please subscribe if you haven't already. Um, check out the sites. And uh, as always, keep emailing, guys. I'm still doing private lessons. If you're interested in watching me mix one of your songs for you, uh, uh, by all means, hit me up, michael at prowestrecording.com. Or if you have some good ideas for tutorial lessons, like topics, uh, hit me up, let me know. And uh, stay tuned for more lessons coming your way soon. Hope you guys have a great day. Peace out.